Good morning and welcome in everyone. Let me see, it looks like we've, oh, good morning, Todd, how are you doing? Alrighty, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and add them to the Q&A and we'll answer them in the order that they're received. Otherwise, I do have some um, FAQs that we can go over as well. Okay, it looks like we got our first question. Can you confirm that we can update user-defined fields via the API using Zapier? Um, so this question's kind of complicated. Um, let's go take a look at our API first. So when we talk about using um, API, there's two parts to this, right? We've got webhooks. Webhooks, the way that, that it works right now, is that you can take information from open to close and you can export it out of open to close and then it can go wherever it needs to go to using a system like Zapier, right? To pull the data and, and, and put it into, you know, a, a Airtable or a spreadsheet or a different CRM in some cases. It just depends on what's available for um, Zapier. When we talk about the API or using the API, we're talking about something different, kind of. Um, both of them, obviously, you can work, you can have them work together, right? Um, and you can have them work separately. You can have it where you just have webhooks or you just have, um, you're just using the API. We have an open API. What that means is that you can use any one of these kinds of uh, uh, get commands to pull the data out of open to close. Now, when it comes to adding it back into open to close, obviously we do work with different um, partnerships that have the ability to go through and they can build out different things to make it so that you can update things within open to close. So to answer your question in a very roundabout way, <laughs> Todd, it, it depends on what you need to update and it depends on what you're using, right? I, I don't know necessarily, I have not necessarily built out anything with our API using Zapier. Um, I believe that most people who are using the API, the open API, they have a different um, software um, going through and assisting them in, in making sure that things are running the way that they need to. Um, now, when it comes to updating user-defined fields, that kind of depends too. When you say user-defined fields, what do you mean? Are you specifically referring to the contacts? Because if we're looking at the contacts, we've got a get for contacts. Looks like this is pulling that information. Get for that specific contact. We've got a post. So if it needs to add, here are all the details that would need to add. And then we've got a put as well. So I would say get into open to close, head over to apps and APIs, right? Apps and APIs open up our API documentation, and then take a peek at what we have right now that's open for our API. I do not know if any of this works with Zapier because again, like I said, I haven't worked with this necessarily. We were gonna have a date field, which is the date we set, send a form. We want to update that field when the form is sent. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe you can use the API to update a, a field. Um, in here, obviously, we've got property fields, you know, get property fields if we need to pull it, post property fields if we need to push it. I mean, it it just depends. I, honestly, Todd, it'd probably be better if we paired you up with one of our integration partners to talk about this, as I haven't had enough experience going through and building out something myself to be able to, you know, properly guide you on how to use this. I would suggest taking our API um, documentation that we have right now and then taking a look at that. Um, usually when we talk about things like this, if you're talking about like, I mean, obviously if you're talking about an intake form, then you don't have to worry about it posting to a specific field. It's going to use the intake form. That's all internal. If you're talking about using an external form like Wufu forms or, or um, interface or something like that, um, that's where I would probably try to get with one of our partnerships to try to have the conversation and figure out exactly how it is that they're doing um, and how they are accomplishing what they're accomplishing with it and then go from there.
I don't think it's a flat now. Yeah. It's not a flat no. Our API, like the the our open API is really, 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 really friendly. Like it's very, very friendly. Um, so I think that you guys like should be able to accomplish most things with it. Um, it just depends on what it is. And that's why I say go check out the documentation, right? Um, for anyone who's like, you just spoke a foreign language. Um, but you're interested in it. You're like, huh, but I heard some things that I am interested in. Definitely, like I said, um, feel free to reach out to us. You know, you can chat with us either by using the in-app chat prompt or you can email us at help but open to close. And you can say, Hannah was talking about the API and webhooks and that sounds like something I might want to look into using in my business. What would be the best way to go about it? Um, and we can set you up with one of our... Uh, partnerships, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get that information over to you. Um, I recently helped share, um, the, uh, I think it's called just webhooks, um, an article that we have on webhooks. So if you are like, well, I don't necessarily, you know, think I need to go and work with, um, and, you know, I'm not going to be doing anything insane or anything with my the API. I really just want to learn how to use webhooks. We do have an article that goes through showing how to use webhooks with a Zapier endpoint. Um, and again, like I said, currently it's just pulling data out of open to close to put it somewhere else. All right. You may have seen something in my account that said something a little different, but it's only outbound webhooks that are available right now for everyone. Okay. Webhooks is also something that's only available on the pro or the scale plan. So keep that in mind as well. But check out this article. You just type in webhooks, how to use webhooks when creating a property. This goes through it, has a bunch of screenshots, shows you what fields are there. You can say webhooks. That way it groups it together. It goes through and it kind of shows you what to do in Zapier as well. You might need a specific Zapier account, like a Zapier Pro account. I'm not sure. Um, I would definitely look into that to see, but this is how you would kind of go through and set it up and see, okay, now what's it going to do next and kind of test it out. One thing I'll also suggest is that when you do start to test things out, if you are looking into using this and you're trying to pull it into a spreadsheet, pull it into a brand new spreadsheet. Do not put it into a spreadsheet that currently has data, right? Because we don't know what it's going to do or if it's going to pull the correct data that you need it to pull. So put it into a brand new spreadsheet. Don't put it into one that has all of the data that you guys have been exporting or pulling from open to close. Start with a new spreadsheet. Just check it out. Test it. If it looks great, awesome. Replace it with the, the spreadsheet that you guys currently have. But I always say like create a copy, use the copy. Don't use the original one, right? Because that way, just in case you ever need to go back and you need to like, oh, you know what? It didn't pull all of the data correctly or it pulled it weird or... Um, I need to pull different kind of data. Oh, I'm sorry. If I need to pull different kind of data, it is an easy thing to correct instead of, oh my gosh, it just messed up my spreadsheet that I've been working on for years. <laughs> cool. Alrighty. Looks like we've got another question. I'm just getting started wondering about the best practices in the use of subtasks. For example, let's say your tasks, your task is to get a fully executed document. Would the task be get FE disclosure X and subtask would be create docs, send a broker for approval, send a buyer for signing, send a co-op buyer, or would you just make notes about the extra stages or would each task be a step? So it kind of depends, Jody. There's a couple ways that you can handle that. I'm going to go ahead and head over into our task templates and I'm going to show you one of the ways that you can build it out. Um, so we'll head down to our three line icon. We'll get down into our hammer icon. We'll go into templates. I'm just going to go to task templates. Um, I'm not sure if you're editing task templates that you already have in here or if you're creating a new task template. I'm just going to open up my main buyer under contract one and I'm going to say edit. Now, as far as for what you're trying to do with it, right? It sounds like we're, and I'm just going to grab uh, the language that you used. If this is a task that um, only happens in specific cases, um, then I would have this on its own task template, right? So if you say, um, yes, I'm handling X disclosure, then have that on like a separate task. template. It's kind of hard because you just said X uh, disclosure X. So I'm not sure if it's like a, if it's it, basically, if it's a conditional disclosure, you don't need it all the time, but you do need it sometimes. 
And the times that you need it, you know when you need it because you've said, yes, I need this because it's um, the house was built prior to 1978 or um, uh, we need that uh, the disclosure based off of the septic or the well or a roof or something like that, right? Um, I would say have it in a separate task template versus adding it to an existing one. That way, when you need it, you can indicate on the intake form, you can indicate with your fields that you do need it and it comes on. But if you don't need it, it doesn't come on. Now, as far as for building out that task, it kind of depends. If you guys are the ones that are building it out, because you said send a buyer for signing, send a co-buyer, send to a co-op broker for, you know, when it gets, it sounds like there's like a couple steps to it. Um, I would still say, you know, uh, disclosure X, right? Exactly how you have it here. We'd want to make sure that we have that scheduled with the property date for whenever it needs to come out, right? So we could say, okay, well, this is actually due usually, and I'm just going to guess, we'll say five business days, let's say after contract acceptance, right? We can build it off of any other date. If you're like, oh, well, I need this disclosure five business days after um, the inspection has been completed or five days after appraisal has been completed, five days after EDM has been received, Remember, you can use whatever date option you'd like to here, okay? I'm just using this as an example. I'm not going to add in a weekend roll, federal holiday roll, or skip federal holidays. I'll let that default to the property. But if I needed to make sure that, oh, actually, no, for this disclosure, I need it to be done like on a Friday versus rolling forward to a Monday. Let's say on your property, you usually have it say roll forward. Just make sure that you do set up those rules as well, right? If we say roll back, that means instead of it rolling to Monday, we want it to be on that Friday, due on that Friday. And if we say roll forward, then it would be pushing it to that. Monday. So here I've added this in. I'm going to say add. Now, as far as for the next part, do we want to use a subtask or do I want to have individual tasks for these? It kind of depends, right? I would say a subtask for this particular one would definitely be um, what you first said, whereas here, where's this one? Create the doc. I think that that's a great subtask. Create the doc. And I would say this subtask needs to be completed before the parent task can be completed, okay? And then it says send to brokers for approval. So you need to get your internal team to approve it, right? This is probably where I would add in a trigger because you have to send it out. And so if you're sending it via an email with an open to close, it kind of depends on what your process is, right? If you're like, oh, honestly, uh, Hannah, we I just send it over... Um, uh, or, or I just like notify them. Let's say you just notify them and then they go and they log in and they check whatever document building system you have. Um, they check dot loop, sky slope, brokerment, and they go, yeah, no, the document looks great. Send it over to the buyer, right? It kind of depends. If you're sending it to them in an email as like a copy, hey, just double check this, e uh, this document, make sure it looks good to me, good to you. Then I would say send a trigger, right? Create a trigger. That way you can send out an email to them, right? When you check off that task, this email goes up, it goes out to them. If you're doing it in a different way where you have it that that person, and let me see if you've added in any more details. Okay, good. If you have it that instead you're all in the office or there's a different way that you usually handle communicating your documents. Hey, just created that document, uploaded it, or uh, it's, it's available in dot loop. Can you just give it a glance before I send it to the buyer? If that's the case, then I would say, add in another subtask. And that next subtask would be sent to broker for approval. Now, depending on what plan you're on can also depend on how you want to handle this too. If you guys are on the scale plan, then you can go get as simple as just sending a message on this particular task to that agent. Hey, agent, just want to make sure that we, you know, or this document's been um, created. Um, I need to send it out to the buyers. Let me get your approval, right? That would be one way you could use this particular tool. But like I said, if you're needing to send them a copy of the document, I would create a trigger. And if you're needing to just make sure that they've seen it or just notify them that it's available in dot loop, I would, you know, you could create a, a, a subtask. You could also still create a trigger. That's with that, right? That says that it's good. Now, send to buyers for signing. This is where it kind of depends, okay? If you have to send them a trigger, then you need to wait for them to respond back, right? They need to say, yes, looks great, right? <laughs> they need to say something back to us. They need to let us know that that, that particular um, 
that the document looks good. So if we're sending out a trigger and I'm just going to pop it in there, send a trigger, um, I'm just going to turn it on and we're going to pretend that this says send a broker. If we're sending it this way, then I would have another task. And this task below here, I would have it that this task is send disclosure X to buyer, right? And for this task, I would build out another trigger. It doesn't need to be a, um, it doesn't need to be a, uh, what's it called? It doesn't need to be a subtask as much as it just needs to be that other task that has that trigger on it. That way, if if you need to wait for approval from them regarding that particular document, brokers, you send a, the document over to the broker, broker looks at it, they go, yeah, this looks perfect. Send it over to the buyer. And you go, okay, cool. The next task that you would have is this. Now, how does this task get scheduled? I would say that you can use the ability to link those two tasks together. Okay. So this second task, send disclosure to disclosure X to buyer. I would say that this should be prompted after get um, FE disclosure has been um, sent. Okay. So we'd be linking the tasks together. This would be a child task, um, I believe, or a parent task. And that's where we kind of run into this child parent task situation that I've seen people run into before, but we'll go ahead and say that this is due the same day as this task has been completed. Okay. And again, we'll just make sure that we're using that same condition or that same logic with the weekend roles and say update. And that's going to link those two tasks together. So the parent needs to get checked off first. And then once this is completed, send disclosure X to buyer, that's when this task comes up. And so the way that you have it is that you'll have that first um, task that you send out, check that off. That email goes out, broker looks at it, broker says, good to go. It looks awesome. Hopefully they're telling you the same day. You have this next task, send disclosure X to buyer. This one also has a trigger. And on that trigger, it has that document and it has that um, request that the buyer completes it and sends it back to you. Now, if you're like, Hannah, actually, when I say send to broker for approval, I can also send it to the buyer and I can also send it to the co-buyer. Or like I can send it all in one. Then you only really need one task, right? With one trigger on it that sends it out to all of those party members. It's just a couple ways that you can handle this. Let me know if that made sense. This is kind of how, this is how I would probably suggest doing it. Since you said that you need to send to broker for approval, this is how you can use those subtasks to make it that they don't, you know, check off that task on accident, um, where it just says create doc. You could be a little bit more specific in create doc if you wanted to as well. Um, you could say um, create doc in and then add in your specific compliance system, a create doc in Skyslope, in Brokerment, in Dotloop. And then you could even have your internal details have the links to those particular ones, right? We can use these hyperlinks. I would say make sure that you say open link in new window. That way it doesn't open it up in the window that you're on. But you can add in that hyperlink to Dotloop or Skyslope or Brokerment, whatever other compliance system that you're using to build out your documents. You can have it built out here, add that in there. And then in your subtask, you can say um, use details to build document, right? Your use details, use XYZ if you need to direct them to it. And the reason that I say you're using the details with your subtasks is that the details can allow you to make hyperlinks. Subtasks is like a read-only situation. You're really only just adding in text or font. You're not really able to add in links or anything like that. Um, just because it's it's really just type it in, add the task. Cool. And I'm going to jump in real quick on this too. Yeah. You're saying for for documents specifically, I know you're talking about subtasks and things like that, but you also pointed out um, for executed documents. Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity to use the documents tab in the transaction. Yes. Um, it, I feel like the documents tab is so underutilized and it is such a big help, but in the documents tab, you can keep track of all these stages and where it's at. And possibly instead of having subtasks, you say, get this disclosure done. And all of the subject of all of the subtasks that you mentioned in your, your, uh, your question can be like the internal details. 
Mm-hmm. But then you have a task later on that says, you know, send to compliance or send here or send there. But follow along at what stage it's in in the document tab, and that will that will help you along to keep track of where it's at and what you're doing and and uh, where it needs to go. No, to- I totally agree. Like I, I second that emotion. That's a, that's a really actually great point, especially for this. Cause as you can see, what I did here is I just clicked on file buttons on the document tab. So I'm on a property. I clicked on file buttons, file buttons also exist in our document templates. So you don't have to feel like, Oh, I need to have a property to do this. You can open up your file buttons on your document templates, but in those file buttons, the ones that I currently have says uploaded to compliance, approved by compliance. If it's missing initials, if it needs correction, if there are property triggers associated with it, if it's been submitted to compliance or not needed. And I might want to, you know, maybe I'll reorder these a little bit. Cause I think that maybe these two, they might mean the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of just depends, right? Feel free to play around with it. But the nice part about this is exactly what Kelly was saying, where you can go through and you can say, okay, well, this has been uploaded to compliance. So I'm going to make sure that that's green, but it hasn't been approved by compliance yet. Right. So it's red. And then once you know that you've gotten it approved, you're going to click on that button. You're going to say it's green. Maybe you're missing initials on it. Um, so you can market that you're missing initials. You could even have a status in here that says something like it's due, right? We can click on our priority button and we can mark this as high priority. What is that going to do? It's going to add it to our health bar. So if we go up to our health bar, we've got our triggers by priority, our tasks by priority, keep going down. Boom. Here's that document with that disclosure showing that it's high priority, right? So there's a couple ways that you can let the system use the system to notify you when you need things. Um, Similar to with this is you can set some of these preset on that document template. So if you know, if you're like, okay, if we are handling, you know, like I said, let's use the home protection plan as an example, like home protection plan, it may or may not always be applicable, right? You said that it is applicable. You can have that document template say that 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 particular document is high priority, So when that document template gets applied to the property, you see that that high priority button is already read on them. So you know, okay, I need to make sure to get my home protection plan on there. If we make sure that our home protection plan is on there, we're also going to want to make sure that we have that file role associated with it. That way, if you need to send it out to that broker, as long as you have that file role associated and you have that file role on your email templates, I'm just going to open up my, I think I have a, I don't know if this one has one on it. It doesn't. Bummer. Let me see if this one has it on it. It doesn't. Bummer. I wanted to show you guys a trigger that has the file role associated with it, but those are probably only going to be on my um, opening emails. Let me see if this one has an opening email. It doesn't. This one doesn't either. Here, I'm going to check off this send opening email tasks, but I've got subtasks on it. So I'm just going to make sure to complete them all. And I'm going to make sure I don't have any conditional logic because sometimes I'm a goof and I put that on there. Okay, cool. So it's loading up my triggers. But when we have that file role associated with that physical document that you have in your document tab, right? As long as we have that file role associated, when we go to look to send out that email, and I'm just going to go down to show you guys. When you're going and checking on that email, as long as you have that file role associated and you have it linked to that email template, boom, you can see here that it's automatically attached. And so using the document management tool in tandem, right? You can use your tasks so that you know. You could Your task could be as simple as um, ensure that XYZ disclosure has been um, added to the documents tab um, and then uploaded and sent out for compliance, right? And then you could have those triggers on that particular task still that allow you to send that document out if you need to send it out or um, have that specific chair that's just waiting for it to be um, sent out to the buyer. It just kind of depends. But great point. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Kelly, bringing up the document management on here. Cool. Let me see. Let me just double check. Yeah, no worries, Jody. Definitely. This is, I mean, this is the perfect place to be, especially if you're a new user and you're kind of figuring it out. Um, Wednesday workshops is recorded. Um, and then we post it in our, um, our, our support center. So all you have to do is you can, again, you can access it in the app, just go to your person icon and you can go down to support center 
or if you're like really quickly trying to find something, you can also go on our website, learn help guides. So it opens up the same link. This is both our support center. Um, from here, you can just type in Wednesday workshop. I'm just going to type that in and enter. We'll click on the top one. It's fine. But if we go to Wednesday workshop, it's going to be all of the Wednesday workshops that we've had so far. It looks like some. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, good. This is the first Wednesday of this month. Oh, no, we had one last month. Looks like last week didn't get uploaded or maybe I forgot to say record. I definitely did it this time, right? Yes, I did. Good. <laughs> um, but this is where they're posted. They're also posted on YouTube as well. Um, so they get posted to YouTube and then we take them and we pop them in an article here. Um, the great thing about it, right, is you're probably going to be like, oh, well, like, I don't know what time it was. Let me just fast forward. We use, um, what are these called? Chapters. So you can just look for your one, your question, how to, you know, whatever way we end up naming it, but you can look for that chapter and you can go directly to that chapter. So you don't have to worry about any other questions we might need to answer. Um, I would also say like, if you're interested, you can always go back and take a look at any of the other ones that we had. Any of our last, I would say our last three, four Wednesday workshops in April, we had a lot of really great information as far as for FAQs. Um, so if that is something of interest to you, you can just click on it here. We'll see, you know, up at the top, what does that look like? You know, what is, what is, uh, what's in this Wednesday workshop? And if any of that information interests you, you can rewatch it if you'd like. Um, but this is where it would be posted. It usually, it's usually like done, I think every Thursday or maybe Friday. Um, I can double check actually, Kelly, would you mind posting that in product stocks and asking or, um, uh, reach out to, um. Gazi, she might know too, specifically when we post it. Cool. So I'd be sending this to separate uh, to parties separately in order. I won't remember. Okay, cool. So yeah, if you're sending them to separate parties, then I would definitely have individual like individual tasks per one. Again, like I would most likely build this out on its own task template. You can name it Disclosure X whatever that actual name is. And again, if that disclosure is only applicable when you're handling a certain process, we'd obviously want to make sure that we have it in that separate task template. That way, when you indicate that you're handling that process, it comes on. But if you say that you're not handling it, then you don't have to worry about that coming on. And then I would have, it can be just as simple as having two tasks. For my HOA with an open to close, I think it's literally like two tasks. Confirm the HOA documents received, send them to the client. So this is an email that goes out if we haven't received it. So this one's task not completed. We reach out to the listing agent and we go, hey, I haven't received the HOA documents yet. Once we know that we've received it, then we have this task, send HOA documents to clients for a review. And this one has a trigger on it. And this one's sending it out to the buyer. So one is confirming that we've received them or emailing that listing agent just in case we need to. And then once we've confirmed that, then we send it out to that client for review. Cool. As a follow-up to a previous question, can we cover backfill? I wanna add a trigger based on the previous described date. I wanna add a trigger to all future and past listings. Uh, it depends on how you have um, your trigger set up. If you're referring specifically to the scale plan, Todd, if you're like talking like, oh, my client's on the scale plan, they have this trigger template, HOAB, already assigned to their properties, and I need to add on another additional field that we just added on, and they need to backfill it. Yes, you shouldn't have any issues with backfilling that necessarily. Um, however, if that particular trigger template is not on those properties, then you will have to go to each one of those properties and manually add it. I actually had a question from a coworker today of, I just reorganized, or we just reorganized fields in a client's account. Um, and now I'm wondering how we can get those fields on there, right? They added new field sections. When you create new field sections and you start to reorganize things with an open to close, open to close doesn't know to add those new field sections that you added in to existing properties. So you have to either use a field template, which is something that's very scarcely used. It's usually something that's only used when you're using property templates, but you'd either use a field template or 
you could use a trigger template to add on those fields. So if that trigger template already exists on those properties, yeah, you'll have no problem. You add on the trigger that you need if it's adding or removing a field section or a field, right? We'll add that on there. Here, I'll just say that I want to bring on, uh, let's just say well details. I don't think I have that one. It wouldn't be applicable for HOA, but let's say I have that and I need to bring that on there. You can add on the condition if you want to, but the main thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to go to backfill and you're going to say insert trigger. There's no properties associated with this one. So technically I can't insert it into any properties, but if you did have it, it would ask you, let me see if I can find one that actually has it on there. Do, 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 do. This one might have it on there. Let's go ahead and say insert. Here we go. Are you sure you want to process triggers after backfill? Are you sure you want to process or perform this action? And so if you're just adding on additional fields, you can totally say process, right? We're not sending out any emails. We're not sending out any text messages. We're just adding more fields to that particular property. Then you're okay to say process after backfill. Now, something, I'm going to throw out a little, a little tip for anyone who is brand new to the system who's like, I'm going to use scale account, right? Um, Something that I might suggest is building out a temp, uh, a trigger template, similar to how this one just says fields, buyer and seller, and have that so that it comes on to every single property. It doesn't matter if it has content or not. You can build out a trigger template that has no content. This is probably a good tip for, um, for you, Todd. You could just say safety measures. <laughs> safety measures and name it a property trigger and say create template. And what I would do is I would make sure that on all of my intake forms, if I'm using intake forms, again, it depends on what you're using, but on all of my intake forms, when it's submitted by the agent, I want to add a template. And that template is my safety measures template. And so for all future properties, they have this blank safety measures template. And why is this important? Why would we want to do this? Because if, like I said, you end up having to restructure your fields, you end up having to restructure, uh, add on more fields or add in different fields or change something about it that's like pretty dramatic. If you have your safety measures on there, as long as it's on those properties from the very beginning, even if it's blank, you can use that backfill option where now I can go in and I can go, oh, shoot, I just created like five new field sections. I need it on like these existing buyer's properties that I have. Let me go ahead and just go in into my trigger template, my safety measures one. Let me, I can add on a condition if I want to. Again, right, we can add on that condition. We can say insert trigger. When we insert that trigger, we can say whether or not we want it to process or not. But what you can do from there is we can say, okay, well, if it's equal to this, then I want all of these fields, field sections to come on and we can use that backfill. And then if you want, when you're done with it, you delete it. It's only going to delete it from the trigger template. It's not going to delete it from those properties. You already inserted it onto those properties, right? So this is like kind of a way that you can do this like safety measure where it's already applied to the properties if you need to go in there and make some adjustments to the fields. You can also do it for any of the other ones as well. So if you're like, oh, I needed to add the, oh no, we have, we had this update in our office um, or we're having a, a bake sale and I really quickly need to get on email, like an email set up on specific properties. You can still use the safety measure to say, well, I need to send out an email. Again, I would use those conditions, right? We want to make sure we're addressing the correct people. Well, all the people coming to the bake sale would be, I don't know, our buyers, Um so I'm going to make sure that my contact or my condition is, is the client type needs to be equal to buyer and buyer needs to exist on the property, right? The buyer contact role needs to exist on the property. Um, since I've said those things, now I'm going to do it. And I'm going to add them on there. That way my TC can go through and update it. The idea is, is that you can use this backfill, this insert trigger to get that trigger quickly onto that property. Like I said, this is something that would only be available on the scale plan. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, if you're on trial right now, you can get onto the scale plan and build out something like this. Just FYI. As long as you're on trial, you're not getting charged yet. So keep that in mind. You can go over to your plan and billing. You can update this to scale and do that. You can you can be on the scale plan for your trial. Um, just if you have questions, definitely feel free to reach out. <laughs> the scale plan is a little, little bit of a beast. 
she's a lot of fun. She's got a lot to her. Um, but that's that's probably what I would suggest. Cool. What about deal structure? How to use edit the deal structure? Are you referring to the follow up boss? I'm gonna need a little bit more um information when we're talking about deal structure. If you're if you're referring to that follow up boss integration that we have, that's the only one that I. That's the only we don't really use deal as a term with an open to close. So there's not necessarily a specific place in open to close that I can think of that would use deal, but we do use deals when we're talking about syncing with deals in that follow up boss um, integration. So let me know if that's what you were referring to, or if you were like referring to, you know, our, maybe our, our property tables and segments, right? Like how this looks, or if you were referring to how the task pipeline shows our tasks, um, I'm just going to need a little bit more information for this one, uh, Chris Mann. Cool. We'll just go ahead and wait, leave that Q&A up, um, and then I'll go over some of the FAQs that we have for this week. Um, We got another quote. Oh, you know what? I've seen this one before. Um, I'm unable to delete a team member right? If we just go over to our organization and users and we see a team member and I go, you know what? I don't want them on here anymore. And I just say delete. Actually, let me choose one that I know for sure has what it needs to have. I'm going to say delete and I say delete and it doesn't do it. You've got this issue. It says there's an issue. You can't do that, right? The first thing that we're going to want to do if we need to remove a team member is we're going to want to go to teams and we're going to want to go through each team that you guys have and make sure that that team member doesn't exist on them. So for example, if I wanted to delete implementation team member, I would go to my team. I'd go to listing. Looks like they're on here. I'm going to need to delete them from this team. So I'm going to click on the little trash can icon and I need to reassign the intake forms and the properties to a different user. So I'm going to select that same listing team that we just selected and I'm going to say they need to go to community team member. And then same thing, listing. And then I'm gonna say they need to go to the community team member. And then I'm gonna say delete implementation team from team. It's gonna go through and it's gonna remove them from that specific team, okay? We'll go to the next one. We'll need to remove it. Looks like they're not on there, perfect. We'll go to the next one. Looks like they're not on there, perfect. Go to the next one. Looks like they're not on there, perfect. Once they've been removed from all of the teams, you're then going to go to implement uh, our team members. You'll locate them. And now you can select that trash can icon and now you can delete them. Now, I'm not going to do it in my system because I do need that implementation um, team member access on there. And I'm actually going to go back to my listings and I'm going to add them back on there. It's really easy to put them back on there. Now, actually taking the transactions that you transferred away from them and putting them back on the implementation team member. That is not so simple. So keep in mind, when I removed this implementation team member, they were removed, right? Which means I can't just go back and be like, oh, well, I just added them back on. Are they going to transfer all back? They will not transfer back. They're all on community team member. So if I need to move any of those transactions back to implementation, I'm going to need to go to those individual properties and I'm going to need to assign them back. What I would probably do in that case, if you found yourself in that situation, is I would probably try to create a table and a segment to get those properties in a list. Once I've added those properties to a list, there's 32 properties here. I'm going to go through and I'm going to add them to the queue. And what this will allow me to do is this will allow me to flip through them, go to more, click on um, access, click on team member users, reassign property. I'm going to say listing. And then I'm going to say implementation team, and I'm going to say update. And then that's going to assign that property to them. Flip to the next page, access. So you see the way that I'm flipping through it is that I've created that view of all the properties that need to be sent over to that um, implementation team member. They need to get reassigned to that implementation team member. I added them to the queue here. I'm going to access and I'm reassigning those properties to them. That way I can make sure that they do get access to the properties that they need to. Whenever we're talking about this, and I'm just going to go ahead and resign this back to myself because this is like my favorite property. Hmm. 
whenever we're talking about updating property access like that, that's kind of one of the quickest ways that I've seen people do it. There is no mass select and reassign. I don't think there is. Oh, oh my gosh, there is a mass select and reassign. This is a new button to me. Kelly, is this a new button to you? Yeah. This is beautiful. Never mind. There is a mass select. <laughs> Ignore everything I said. This is wonderful. I didn't even realize this. So there is a mass select. Yay. Oh, I should have clicked on that first and seen. Oh man, I this is new to me. I did not see this. So if you've got new, if you've just hired new people, right, on your team, and you're like, because you know, let's say your your solo TC has just gotten overwhelmed. You guys are running a hundred transactions within open to close, and your new TC is like, uh, maybe we need some help, and you hire a VA to help out with those things. Looks like you can now select the properties and mass assign them to that that um, person, that new team member. Um, I imagine you'd obviously be able to do it in the reverse too. Yay. I'm just going to go back to my teams really quickly. I'm going to go to implementation. I'm just going to add on some of those roles that we had because I want to make sure that they have tasks assigned to them in case they're using this. Let's just do that. Cool. Cool. Awesome. We learned something new. All of us learned something new there. Okay. Looks like we've got um, some more information uh, for deal structure like subdo, cash, hybrid, uh, where to edit, just like the contract status. So like you're talking about like the 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 financial uh, or like like the finance type or, or deal structure, how to edit, how to use and edit the deal structure. So it sounds like you're trying to update or edit a field. Um, what we're going to want to do is we'll go to our three line icon. We'll head down to our hammer icon and we're going to get into our field editor. Now, I don't think we have a term like feel uh, like deal right now. So it looks like I don't have a term that's called deal within my open to close account. Um, for what you mentioned, I have one for finance. I, it's called finance type in my account. It seems like that might be the same verbiage. If we click on finance type, you're going to see that it's a choice field. We've got cash, conventional, VA, FHA, rural, USDA, and then other terms added a pin note. So this is kind of like a field that has already been built out. You can edit this field if you'd like to. So if you want to change it to say deal, it's just about updating the field label. And then you're going to also want to update that merge field as well, right? Just in case you need to bring it on anywhere. I don't want you to be like, what is a financing type, right? If you don't use that terminology, you're going to want to make sure that we grab that name, pop it into the merge field as well. So here we've updated the field label, the merge field will go down. And then we can say, I understand and update. And it's going to update it for your entire system that now this particular column or this particular field is going to be changed from finance type to deal. Now, if you want to create a new field, you're like, no, 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 Hannah, I like finance type. I need a different field that's specifically for deals. Then you're just going to locate the field section that you want it in, whether that's in finance details or you want it in your property details or you want it in your critical details, wherever you want that particular field, I would locate it. So I'm just going to say, we're going to put it in our finance details. I'm going to select add field. Once again, I'm going to pop in that name, deal. I'm going to pop that in name for my, for my merge field as well. When it goes to field type, I'm going to be selecting choice. I can skip over placeholder text. I'm not going to be entering in a placeholder text. It's a choice. I want to be able to select from a dropdown, subto, cash, hybrid, whatever other fields you might need. I'll say choice. We probably don't want to be able to select multiple if we're using any sort of conditional logic. So if you need to say, well, if the deal is equal to cash, then I need X, Y, Z, then we're going to want to skip over having select multiple choice. Okay. So we're just going to say choice and we'll say add. Now it's going to ask us, what are those options? I'm just going to grab the ones that you shared. Paste that in there. Grab cash. Paste that in there. Grab hybrid. Paste that in there. And then I'm just going to add in an other for what you said, the et cetera. I can reorder these if I'd like to. So if subtoad needs to be first, I'm just going to drag it to the top. And then I can drag cash. And then I can drag hybrid. What I would do from here is that if this information needs to be filled out or used on your intake form, right? The intake form that agents could fill out, that TCs could fill out, that if you had public forms, anyone could fill out if they had that hyperlink, we're going to want to make sure that we have this purple star enabled on our field choices, okay? The reason that this purple star is helpful is because otherwise, they're not going to be able to see that field. We need to be able to say that this field needs to be shared in the portal. If you do not want to share this in the portal, you can still have this field come on to the property, 
right? And have it that your internal TCs, your internal team members can use the field. But if we if we have that star, if that we have that purple star not selected, it's a, just a clear star, then what that's going to do is it's going to let you see it, but you're not going to be able to see it on that intake form. I think for a field like this, you might want it on your intake form. So I'm just going to go ahead and select purple on my end. I don't need to do anything else with these fields now. I'm going to go ahead and say close. And here at the top now we see that deal. Similar to how we had to select that purple star for our options or our choices, we're going to want to make sure that we select that purple star for our field itself. So the deal itself needs that purple star enabled as well to show it on the intake form and into our portals to be able to use it for for our integrations, okay? So now we have this deal field that's built out. If you ever need to go back in there and you need to go, oh, well, it's not just other, Hannah, I've got the other options that I need. I need to enter those in. You're just gonna navigate back to your field editor. You're gonna locate that field. I am very lazy. I'm gonna show you, cause I tried to do it before. I'm very lazy because I have a lot of fields and I'll use, I'm on a, a PC, so I use control F and that allows me to search the web page. If you were on a Mac, you can do command F. I'm just going to type in deal and then I'm going to press enter on my keyboard. And it's just going to take me down to it and it's going to highlight it for me. All this is doing is searching the web page. I use this for a number of different web pages as well. If I go on to, uh, let's say I'm, I'm like baking something, like if I have a recipe up, I will use like control F to search for what's the temperature. I just type in temp. <laughs> and I go down and go, okay, cool. This is what I need to preheat my oven to. This is a tool that you can use on a ton of other websites as well. It's it's just searching the web page. Once we locate that field, we're just going to click on it and it's going to open up both of those panels for us. We can add in more options. We can delete options that are here. We can update options if you need to add in more language to those options. Whatever it looks like for you guys, you can update it here. If you need to change it to a multiple choice field, right? You can still do that. Here where it says multiple select, we can update that to multiple select. If you want to change the way it looks, right? Maybe you don't want it to be a drop down, similar to how this was a drop down, and instead you'd prefer radio buttons on that intake form. We can change this to yes, that we want radio buttons. Usually when it comes to two or more answers, I think the stacked looks better as well. So I'd say yes, you want it stacked. Then I'd say I understand and update. And that way that field looks a specific way. I believe I have my finance type on my intake form. So let me see so I can show you kind of what the look looks like. I think I have my finance type on here. Finance, no, 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 no. Let me search page. Finance type. Oh, okay. I don't have finance type on here. I thought I did. Hold on a second. Let me get that finance type on my intake forms. That way I can show you guys what that looks like. Well, I'm not going to make it required. I'm just going to bring it on. Sweet. So this is what it would look like if we want it to have the radio buttons and we want it to wanted it to be in a list. This is kind of how it would look like if we wanted to use it on our intake form. And that's just updating again. We'd go down to our hammer icon into our field editor, locate the field that we're looking for, deal, select that field. And we're gonna wanna make sure that intake form radio buttons is selected as yes and intake form stacked is selected as yes as well. And this is an example of what that would look like. Cool. Let me know if that was what you were referring to as far as for, you know, deal structures or, or adding in those um, particular fields. Um, when we talk about starting with open to close, the first thing that all of you guys should be starting with is reviewing your fields, right? Because your fields are going to be the backbone of your system. It powers everything in your system. That's what your fields do. Um, it's also really important for reporting, for commission, for um, one sheets, just literally everywhere. That's where your fields are used. So the first thing that we suggest when I go through and we're training you guys on this, when you go to open and close, you go to our onboarding series and you get started, we go to the get started guide. The first thing that I tell you to do in this is to do your fields, <laughs> right? I tell you to click on your fields and you're going to do your fields first. 
after you're done reviewing the fields, you might need to go back and add in more, update more, or do what you need to do. It's kind of why I made that suggestion with the property triggers. Um, but as you, once you feel good about your fields, you feel like you've customized it, it's, it's updated, it matches your language more, then you're going to want to head back over to our onboarding series and you're going to want to take a look at contacts and documents next. Contacts is specifically showing you how to add in your contact roles. It also has a lot of really solid information for how to use contact connections and contact groups, making things easier and, and um, gelling things up so that it's a lot more functional in the, in the when you start to actually use the system live. Like we're talking about trying to save you, you know, five minutes worth of you going through and adding people to a transaction. It could be one click on the property. You know that it's a... Uh, you're working with this specific agent. They have this group of, of um, inspectors that they recommend. They have lenders that they recommend, that they they have other party members that they recommend, right? And you could just assign a contact group. Boom, Hannah's team. Boom, all these people come on. Versus let me go in and manually type in their names to add in every single person that I might need on this transaction. Assigning that contact group, going through that contact training, that's extremely crucial for you guys. It saves so much time. I see way too many people skipping over it. Same thing with our documents. I talk about how to set up your file roles and how to use those documents here on the document tab, um, as well as how to go in there and update your um, document templates. That way you don't have to stress out about, well, if I... I hope, hopefully, you know, we've added this document to the email, use your file roles so that it automatically adds them on there. It's the whole idea. Next, I suggest getting into your task templates, making sure that all of that, you know, your tasks are in there. They look good. They're solid. Then I would say, look at your emails, make sure your email templates look good as well. Making sure that, you know, the, the language is there. That you, if you need to update or import or add in any more, you have them. And then your intake forms and your intake forms is going to bring everything together. It's going to bring all these factors together. Your intake forms is going to say, okay, what fields do you want to ask? Which one of your custom fields do you want to ask for? What contacts do you want to ask for on that intake form? What documents do you need for that intake form? What task templates do you need to apply? And with those task templates, if you're using task triggers, you can make sure that your email templates are populating correctly as well using that, you know, the smart block and the merge field um, content um, that automatically gets pulled onto your emails. So think of like your intake forms as like, it's the thing that wraps everything together. It blends everything together. And then using open to close is just the front end. How do I navigate the system? What does a property look like? How do I use my property tables and segments or my trigger task pipeline? Um, that's usually what I would suggest the order in which you guys can start. Now, obviously there's a ton of other features in here that are not included in that. The onboarding guide is meant to just get you started. It's meant to get your, what you're currently doing into open to close so you can start using it, right? That way you don't have to work through this weird transition time where you're paying for two systems. You got to pay for your previous system and you got to, you know, set up this one at the same time, like get everything in here buy previous system. Now it's time for open to close. And then as you guys continue to use the system, that's where I would suggest coming and joining our Wednesday workshop, which is this class today, um, where we can go through and we can talk more about like, what are the next steps? And usually next steps are, let's take a look at our date template. Let's take a look at one sheets. Let's take a look at commissions or reporting. Let's take a look at those intake forms and see what else can we do to improve them and make things easier for you. What kind of updates can we do for your task templates to make them better for you? What kind of updates can we do for your email templates or your um, document templates? Are we ready for smart blocks? So there's a lot more that you can continue to grow and build in your system. And if you ever feel like you've hit a wall and you go, um, it feels great, but I don't know what to do next, reach out, chat with us. Tell us what you're struggling with. Reach out and say, this is where I'm struggling. Is there an easier way to do it? That's one of the great things about when Todd joins is because he goes, this is what I'm struggling with. Is there an easier way to do it? And then we just figured out <laughs> a really great way to handle with when you're on the scale plan of adding on those fields if you need to, right? So that's the whole idea of this is we're a community. We're going to work together. We're going to try to help um, figure out what strategies make the most sense, but definitely feel free to reach out to us. Our support team is amazing with this. And if they get stumped, they loop us in. We all work together on it. Cool. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Thanks for asking. It was a really great question. Um, cool. Alrighty, guys. Well, we're at the last five minutes of our training. 
Um, if there's any more FAQ or if there's any more questions, go ahead and pop them in there. Um, I have some more FAQs, but they're kind of a, they're pretty in depth. <laughs> so I probably won't go through them today, but I might save them for next week if we need them. Um, other than that, thank you guys for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks Todd for coming in. Thanks for asking that question. We just figured out, you know, like a, like you said, like a genius way to handle it when we have fields, um, that need to get added on additionally, um, using that like quote unquote safety measures, property trigger. I'm actually probably going to have to post about that in product stocks just to make sure that our, our other team members can make that suggestion as well. Um, cool. Alrighty guys, well, I'll go ahead and leave the room open for like one more minute if you guys have any other last minute questions and then we'll end it for today. Oh, you know what? Let me go over my FAQ, like my my final call thing that I usually do. If you guys have questions, you can reach out to us by using the chat. You can also email us at help it open a close. If you guys are looking for onboarding, we have an onboarding, we have onboarding options that are avail available. If you're looking for our help guides, here's our help guides. Or if you're looking for webinars, we do have new webinars. Um, Jody, not sure if you're still on here, but I would definitely take a look at importing um, 101 um, as a, a possible solution for s importing some of your information into open and close. Um, if you don't have any of that, oh, okay, wonderful, awesome, Jody. Um, so if you if you have like content, you've got like task templates, you've got email templates that you need to get into open and close, and you're like, do I really have to copy paste all of these in here? take a look at this importing um, tool. Like we we just made an, a recent update to it where you're able to import a lot more details when it comes to your task templates, your email templates, um, and more. Same thing with importing like contact roles and file roles and stuff like that. So there's been some updates with this, with our importing tool. And so this might be a super advantageous tool for you to kind of like use in getting started. Um, and then obviously feel free to check out any of our other um any of our other, uh, sorry, um, webinars as well, right? We still go over contacts, uh, fields, contacts, documents. All of these are less than 30 minutes. So they're pretty easy to just go in, pop on, eat a snack and watch. Um, but yeah, cool guys. Sweet. Well, have a wonderful rest of your guys' day. Um, stay hydrated. Make sure you stretch. It's good for your legs if you stretch. Um, and I will talk with you guys next week, hopefully.